Hello, everyone. This is Chris from Wisconsin Land and Water, and thanks for joining us today. Wisconsin Land and Water is a 501c3 that supports the efforts of land conservation departments and committees throughout the state in a variety of ways, including hosting trainings like this. Um, just a few notes before we begin. I'm recording this webinar and it will be posted on our website and I'll also send you the link when it's available along with a link to an evaluation. We're going to take questions throughout the presentation through the chat line at the bottom of the toolbar. You can submit a question at any time and we will get as many of them answered as we can at the end of the presentation. So today, our presentation will be on managing water where it lands, and our presenters are Megan Hogfelt with the City of Superior and Chris Schultz with Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. And now I will turn it over to the presenters. Thank you, Chris. Um, again, my name is Megan, and I'll start with a short introduction, and then we'll jump right into um, Chris Schultz's uh, presentation. Uh, so as everyone knows, this is Wisconsin Stormwater Week. It's um, a pretty exciting time. It's one of our first ever um, Stormwater Weeks in Wisconsin. Um, and so today the topic is uh, Rain Collection 101. And um, if you're interested in learning more about Wisconsin Stormwater Week, I'm dropping the link into the chat. Um, but throughout this week, we have different topics that we're covering over social media campaigns. And um, we have a number of partners that have signed on um, who are supporting the Wisconsin Stormwater Week through their social media, along with events throughout the, the state of Wisconsin. Um, this, this next Thursday, and I guess tomorrow, the Lawn Care 101 and this uh, Thursday, Leaves 101, there'll be other um, webinars um, as well, free webinars for educational um, topics around the themes of the day. Um, so what is stormwater? Um, some of you might come in with some knowledge about what it is, and um, but I thought I'd just start off by describing what it is and um, how it's um, directly can directly impact our, our surface waters throughout the state. Um, so it's rain or snow melt and it runs off in um, our streets, our lawns, and it collects pollutants along the way as it heads to the storm drains or ditches that connect our streets to our streams. And um, those rivers and lakes that are receiving that pollution, um, it's harmful to them. You know, the wildlife that's um, around those streams and lakes and then also um, the water quality health um, so why is, um, let's see here, why is stormwater pollution prevention important? So, um, as I just mentioned, most storm drains in Wisconsin connect our streets to our streams. Uh, this means that pollution is heading to our, essentially our drinking water sources. Um, I know up here in the city of Superior, Lake Superior is our drinking water source. And eventually all of that water that leaves our city, um, heads to Lake Superior, which is uh, holds 10% of the world's fresh water. Um, so it's an important resource that we would like to protect along with other lakes and streams in and around Wisconsin. Um, so you might have uh, noticed that I said most storm drains in Wisconsin connect our streets to our streams, but not all of them do. Uh, city of Superior and the city of Milwaukee are two cities that uh, still have combined sewage districts uh, or combined sewage systems. And here is a diagram showcasing both the separate storm sewer system, which is more common. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see the separate pipes for stormwater and wastewater, where the stormwater runoff goes down storm drains and to a local stream, as you can see. Maybe you can follow my mouse as I direct, I have it hovering over that pipe for stormwater, and then the wastewater from our homes and businesses goes to a wastewater treatment plant for treatment and disinfection before entering our waterways. Um, but the other side of the coin, our combined sewer system, it's uh, just one pipe. So this is a traditional form of um, sewer collection system, and it's where both stormwater and wastewater enters our system and heads to a treatment facility. So in some places, wastewater is treated, wastewater and stormwater is treated. 
Um, traditionally, they are operating to, um, they do operate to overflow. Um, I know I can only speak for the city of Superior, but we do, um, over the past 10, 15 years, we have worked to almost eliminate that problem. Um, and because during big rain events that kind of overflows or um, charges our system with a ton of extra rainwater. So it, overflows can happen. Um, but getting back to um, stormwater, um, so most of our, again, our drains connect our streets to our streams. And um, I just wanted to highlight some examples of stormwater pollution. And um, these might look really, really familiar. Um, in our day to day, we could see uh, trash in the streets, um, someone forgetting to pick up after their pet. Uh, perhaps there is oil sitting in someone's uh, uh, parking lot or um, on the street. These are all examples of things that stormwater can pick up and bring to our streams. And so this week, and um, we are highlighting ways to prevent that pollution. Um, so we're picking up that trash, we're uh, picking up the pet, uh, pet waste and making sure that that oil on the ground isn't there uh, by checking our oil pans. Um, just simple tips and tricks to make sure that our waterways stay uh, safe and clean. Uh, so just some uh, information before we dive into some stormwater conversations. Um, Chris, uh, take it away with your rain garden. Looks like we have some polling questions. Um, take a minute to answer these. There should be two questions. Okay, it looks as though people are starting to answer those. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I'm I'm going to jump in and make sure that I can advance the slide. Which is not happening right now. Might have to. There we go. Oh, there we go. Nice. Okay, so there, I, I end up having a little bit of a delay. So bear with me, audience. I might not always be on the slide I anticipate that I'm going to be on. Um, but my name is Chris Schultz. I'm a senior project manager with Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. I've been with the district for over 30 years now and have been doing uh, green infrastructure in whole or in part for about the last uh, 14 years or so. So I'm going to be talking specifically about managing water where it falls using rain gardens. And I'm trying to advance the slide. There we go. Um, so here's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. I'm going to talk just a little bit about my organization and why we do this sort of stuff, um, why managing water where it falls is important to us. And I'm going to back up. This is the beauty of technology when we're trying to double share a screen. So I apologize. Uh, but I'm going to talk about specifically about um, rain gardens and, and how to install them as well. So MMSD, uh, down in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, we're often confused with our, our, our municipalities, the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee Water Department um, and the Milwaukee, yet yeah, the Milwaukee Water Works. So we are none of those. We are actually a regional government agency um, established by state law. And the two main things we do is we provide water reclamation and flood management for over a million customers, um, all of Milwaukee County, excluding the city of South Milwaukee because they have their own treatment works. And then a ring of suburbs in whole or in part that um, surround Milwaukee County and our service area is about 411 square miles. Uh, we have two water reclamation facilities at MMSD. Uh, we don't use the term wastewater treatment anymore. We stopped using that term um, probably uh, maybe five, six, or seven years ago, maybe longer, because we uh, really have a high focus on sustainability. And we kind of look at everything that comes to us as a potential resource. So um, I might slip up and use that term, but I've been doing it for a while now, and I call them water reclamation facilities, both of which can handle 300 million gallons per day. So they're both pretty large. In addition to that, we have an inline storage system. When Megan was talking earlier about um, 
cut the combined sewer and the separate sewer and combined sewer overflows, uh, what we have in place is the ability to uh, capture some of that water that would otherwise be a combined sewer overflow uh, to the tune of 521 million gallons. And we can hold that water until we do have some capacity at the reclamation facilities to pump it back out of there and um, reclaim the water and then release it into Lake Michigan. So we're talking about a different lake here as well. Uh, the district has 300 miles of sewers that we own and our private partner Veolia Water operates. And we have about a 26 and a half square mile combined sewer area. So why are we so concerned about managing water where it falls? Well, if we manage water where it falls, we're not gonna have to manage it somewhere else that's likely less desirable, more expensive or both, but it's gonna help us improve water quality. And it's gonna help us diminish the likelihood of basement backups, those combined sewer overflows that I spoke about and flooding. And it's also gonna help us mitigate um, pollution, all the stuff that Megan talked about that's laying on the ground that washes in, into the sewer system. Um, if we can capture that in our combined sewer area and hold that and not have a combined sewer overflow, that's good for everyone. And it's also gonna help diminish stream bank erosion. So what does green infrastructure do? We're talking today about rain gardens and rain barrels, which are two types of green infrastructure. Uh, green infrastructure basically uses or mimics uh, mother nature's processes uh, to handle, to manage water where it falls by either storing it, slowing it down, evapotranspiring, which means it's using the root systems of the plants and leaves and trees and leaves and plants to put it back up into the atmosphere and help infiltrate it into the ground. So our organization, MMSD and, and Green Infrastructure, why this type of stuff is important to us is because it can help us, especially in our combined sewer area, help us reduce the amount of water that needs to be reclaimed. Um, it reduces the amount of stormwater runoff. It keeps clear water in the sewer system or clear water out of the sewer system. And we operate under a Wisconsin Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit that's issued to us by the DNR um, that tells us how we have to operate. And within that permit, we do have the first, um, the first green infrastructure utilization goal in the state of Wisconsin was put in our permit that dictates that we are supposed to capture 50 million gallons of stormwater using green infrastructure by the year uh, 2023, which it is. And we have actually surpassed that. Just before we started the webinar, I looked at our dashboard and we're at actually at 125 million gallons right now. And we have an audacious goal of it's part of our 2035 vision of capturing 740 million gallons of water using green infrastructure. And we came up with that number because it equates to the amount of water um, generated by a half inch of rainfall over the impervious surfaces within that 411 square mile uh, service area that I spoke about earlier. So these are a variety of types of green infrastructure. Um, we have a program where we do land acquisition in the headlands that are actually out of our service area to help protect the water before it even gets down to our waterways here in Milwaukee. Um, but the two types of green infrastructure we're gonna talk about today are both rain barrels and rain gardens. So I'm gonna jump right into the rain gardens. So that is what a rain garden looks like. A recently installed one that I participated in a year or two ago. Um, that's actually probably a pandemic rain garden. I remember wearing a mask when we put that in. Uh, so what is a rain garden? Basically, it's just a depressed area in your landscape. It has to have a water source. You don't want to just put a rain garden uh, anywhere. Uh, there is a misconception that I have this wet spot in my yard, so I'm going to put a rain garden there to help, um, help manage that water. Uh, well, a rain garden doesn't work that way. A rain garden actually needs a well-drained spot to go into because it's designed to capture water from a water source slow it down, help it soak it into the ground. And it's generally, if not always, uh, planted with predominantly Wisconsin native plants because of their deep root systems. 
So I'm going to do this in four steps, uh, but I'm going to add the caveat here that um, when we do rain barrel work or rain garden workshops here, uh, either online or in house, those are usually an hour, hour and a half, pretty intense workshops. We're going to do this in four steps and probably about uh, 15 minutes that I have remaining to talk. Um, but you're going to learn everything you need to know for the basics of installing a rain garden. And I will highlight some resources available at the end of my presentation that go into greater detail. There are um, on our website, which I will mention, uh, freshcoastguardians.com. That's the green infrastructure brand of Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. Um, we have a lot of resources, including two different how to install a rain garden manuals that are published by Wisconsin DNR. There's a short version and a long version, but we're gonna go through that in a bit of a crash course here in the next several minutes. Uh, so the first thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna select a lo location. Now, the way I present these things also might not be the order that they necessarily would lo logistically fall in for you, but this is how they fell in for me. Um, that is my house on the screen. So the first several slides are going to be my house and I will be installing a rain garden. I don't know if my cursor, cursor is visible or not, but I, there's a general area in front of these bushes and these shorter plants um, on the slide that's on your screen, that's where my rain garden is going to go. So a logical question might be, well, where is your water source going to be? Because there's no downspout there. You're correct, there is no downspout there, but by the end of the year, there will be one because uh, the only reason I'm actually installing a rain garden is because I have some major roof problems that are not visible on the screen. But as part of having those rectified, uh, I asked the contractor to take one of my downspouts off of the storm sewer system because all of my downspouts are hard piped to the storm sewer and put one on that left hand corner of my house directed to the edge of where those um, alpine green current plants are, the taller bushes. And that's where I'm gonna start my rain garden. So you're gonna wanna stay six to 10 feet from away from your foundation because you don't want to stop and back up water against your foundation. The whole idea is to help manage water where it falls, not against your foundation, um, and especially not into your basement. So you're also gonna need to know some information. You're gonna need to know where your sewer lateral leaves your house. And that is the pipe that carries away your wastewater out to the municipal uh, collector sewer. And generally, you don't want to go right up against a sidewalk because rain gardens um, will hold a little bit moisture than the rest of your yard will. And when the weather starts getting cold, uh, you will get some freeze thaw and you really don't want to undermine uh, your sidewalk. So you don't want to have the deepest part of your rain garden right up against the sidewalk. If you abut it with the edge of your rain garden, that's probably OK. But if you can, I would just try to avoid the sidewalk altogether. So uh, before I selected my location, I wanted to make sure it would work. I was pretty sure it would because I've done some prior landscaping and I've called Digger's Hotline before. But for the purpose of uh, generating this wonderful slide here to show you where all my um, stuff is, uh, the blue flag there and the blue stripe is my water line right in the middle of my lawn. And the two greens are, one is my storm sewer that's coming off of the downspout that's right next to my garage door. At present, my entire front of my house, the upper roof and the lower roof, and this a slightly lower roof over the porch, all drain through a downspout right next to my uh, garage door. So that's an awful lot of sheet flow through a pretty small downspout. So that's probably causing part of my roof problem. So to alleviate that, I'm going to take the upper roof off, drop a downspout on the left-hand side, as I mentioned earlier, and direct that into my rain garden. You'll see I have a lot of existing landscaping, including a pollinator garden in front of my porch. So what I'm going to end up doing is blending my rain garden into the existing landscaping as much as I can. No matter what, um, you're going to want to call Digger's Hotline because you're going to want to know where your stuff is. You'll be digging down six to eight inches in the heart of your rain garden. Probably is beneficial if you're not sure if you've selected a good spot or not, like I did, uh, to call them ahead of time because that may dictate 
a different location for your rain garden. So how are you going to size your rain garden? Well, there's a lot of technical information in the two manuals that I referenced, but to boil it down to a quick rule of thumb, um, you're gonna need to know the amount of surface area that's going to generate water that's gonna enter your rain garden. And in my case, it's that upper roof that is outlined in blue. So you're gonna wanna use some sort of a tool, whether that's Google Maps or some sort of a geographic information system, uh, most people use Google Maps and you're going to want to measure the roof surface that is going to drain to the downspout and ultimately to your rain garden. You're going to find that area, which in my case is about 470 square feet. I was a little generous with the area because you're not directly measuring the slope of the roof, but it's close enough. And you're simply going to divide that by four and that's going to tell you how big your rain garden needs to be. So when I divide mine, I did a little bit of rounding. Well, I didn't on the screen, but I figure that my rain garden is gonna need to be about 120 square feet, which is a pretty sizable rain garden. So once you have that measured, um, if you look close, you'll, you'll see I also have a yellow flag on the other side from Digger's Hotline because I have a gas line over there. So my rain garden fits absolutely perfectly in the spot I was hoping it would just off the edge of my existing landscape. And those little American flags that I poked in, that is my major area that's marking at least that 120 square feet. Uh, I'm gonna take out all that sod to the bottom left of the screen as well. And I'm gonna blend all of that in to my existing landscape. Unfortunately, I didn't know I was gonna put this rain garden here. Um, so I'm gonna have to move some of my existing stuff around so that I have some more visual appeal, because if you're doing a rain garden, you might as well have that visual appeal, put some planning in. So some of that lower stuff is gonna end up moving off to the side and towards the front of my rain garden. Um, those aren't all necessarily native plants, uh, but I'm not necessarily a native plant purist either. I will mix and match, but I, I tend to try and get as many natives in as I can. So I do have some, um, I have some black eyed Susans, I have some pale purple coneflowers and other stuff in there and some butterfly weed. So I'm gonna save all that. I'm probably gonna move some of those bushes out of the way and work with the visual appeal. So you just use something flexible, a hose, a rope or anything, and then spray paint the outline of your rain garden. This next slide is where we're gonna jump away from my house because I have not gotten any further yet because my roof isn't fixed yet. So we're at a different location. Um, and most of these slides are going to vary from one location to another. But first thing you're gonna to wanna to do then is dig out um, the outline of your rain garden. And you will want to put a berm on the downslope side of your rain garden. You don't want to berm super high. Uh, in my case, it, my berm's not gonna be high at all because you don't want to be backing up water in a torrential rain uh, all the way back to your foundation. So there's more guidance on that in the DNR manuals. Um, I don't plan on doing a whole lot of measuring. I, I know my front lawn pretty well. I know how it slopes. I know the type of soil I have. I know that it drains pretty well and I don't have any standing water there. So I'm not doing any sort of an infiltration test. So this is the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dig out my outline. I'm gonna put a berm on the downslope side. I am then going to dig out the rest of the sod and then I'm going to dig out the soil to a depth of about six to eight inches and and kind of taper that up towards the sides. The DNR manual um, gets pretty particular about having a flat bottom to your rain garden and the slope and all of that. Uh, I've installed quite a few of these use with our interns that you see in in the picture here and I don't know that it necessarily matters that you have an absolutely flat bottom to your rain garden, um, but that's what the what the, the manual says. So I'm gonna dig out six to eight inches in the middle of the, the heart of the rain garden on that, that slide where the American flags were. I'm gonna try to get the bottom of my rain garden as flat as I can within reason, but I'm probably not gonna take a level and work that really hard. 
So the next thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to mix some dirt that you're going to put in your rain garden. What I have a tendency to do is once I take that sod off there, if I have some pretty good topsoil in there, I may not dig out six to eight inches. I may save some of that topsoil and reuse it, just break it up and turn it like you would a vegetable garden. But I certainly am gonna add some compost and sand, or I'm going to get some sort of an engineered soil or a special type of soil from uh, a local nursery and have that delivered to fill in my rain garden. And the reason you wanna do that is you do want some good soil in there, even though these are native plants, uh, it's going to take a year or two for those plants to really get established, uh, spread, and, and sink their roots. The beauty of native plants is they sink their roots much, much further than a typical grass lawn will, which is how you're going to manage more water on your lawn than you ever would with a simple manicured uh, lawn. So then you're just going to add the dirt. You're going to dump it into your hole. You're going to rake it smooth and the level should be just below the edge of the hole that you, you've dug. It can be pretty even with the bottom of your berm, but the whole idea is the water source directs into your rain garden, slows down in there, spreads out, soaks into the ground somewhat, and if it has to, it can overflow that berm before it backs up towards your house. Personally, I've never seen a rain garden get so inundated with, with rainwater that that happens, although we do get some pretty heavy rainfalls. So just bear in mind that you don't want to back up water against your foundation. So we're jumping pretty close to the end of the rain garden. So um, I don't have a slide about selecting your plants. But I do have some recommendations there. There is a downloadable plant selection tool on that website, freshcoastguardians.com. This is relatively user-friendly. Both versions of the DNR Rain Garden Manual have species recommendations towards the back of, of the manuals. But you're gonna wanna think about visual interest. So in my case, I don't wanna put anything exceptionally tall towards the front of my rain garden, or you won't see any of the other plants behind that. So I probably will have to move some of my existing landscape around. Um, some people like tall stuff in the middle, short stuff around the edge, but you're gonna wanna think about that. And when you look at the different characteristics of the plants in the manual, it's a good idea to both vary the bloom times. So something is always in bloom for the pollinators because rain gardens uh, attract pollinators um, beyond your wildest dreams. I have four or five different pollinator gardens in my yard. And it's like watching butterfly and hummingbird TV. So they can add visual interest. They can be fun to watch, but you're gonna wanna pick your plants carefully based on sun exposure. Most natives do like a lot of sun and how tall they're gonna get and how wide they're gonna spread. So you're gonna wanna allow room for the plants to spread. Our plant tool also does have some some very typical layouts like where you might want to put some shrubs versus some forbs versus some sedges versus some prototypical um, natives and it is relatively user friendly but you can probably get by just by uh, observing the characteristics of the plant either in our plant tool or in the dnr manual and planning accordingly so then you're going to want to get your plants in the ground um, in an ideal situation, all of these would be in my front yard, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, I just haven't got that far with the rain garden yet. So you're going to want to get your plants in the ground. Um, dig the hole deep enough that the roots can spread. Uh, plan how you're planting. Don't paint yourself into a corner and back over plants that you've already planted. It happens all the time with our interns, but we're getting better and better. And you just wanna get those plants in the ground to the level they were, match the level where the dirt was in the pot. Don't go exceptionally deep, don't go too high, just try and match the dirt level in the pot. And just about last, but certainly not least, you're gonna to wanna to direct your water source to the rain garden. Um, in my case, I'm gonna hopefully have my contractor directly 
pipe that to the edge of the rain garden. If not, I'll put an extender on that like there is in the slide on the screen. And you're gonna to wanna to run that into some river rock or stones, um, which, which will slow the energy of that water from whipping into your rain garden and possibly causing some erosion and damaging the plants. I probably would recommend uh, maybe some little larger rocks than this or a greater amount of them, but that's the whole idea is to get that water to spread out over the rocks and disperse evenly into the rain garden. And last, I always mulch um, a rain, rain garden. You probably need to do that less and less over the years, in future years as your plants spread. But you do want to help hold that moisture in there and give those plants a good start. Uh, you want to spread it evenly and take care not to damage or bury the plants. And again, don't forget to, to um, break up that energy of the flow as it enters the rain garden. Let the water flow over some rocks so it doesn't take all your mulch away as well. And that is all there really is to installing a rain garden, uh, minus a lot of the technical details that are actually in the manual. Uh, but on screen are a couple examples of rain gardens pretty much immediately after they were installed several years ago. You can see sometimes you have to get a little creative to get your water source down and in there. And this one doesn't go to the edge of the rain garden. It kind of goes into the heart. Um, and they had to run that downspot extender through the corner of the porch and down in, into the rain garden. Um, you can put rain gardens in spots where that water flows to that is not a downspout, but predominantly we install our rain gardens in locations uh, where a downspout can be directed to them. So the big long uh, URL that's at the bottom, uh, this, the shorter version of that is has been posted in the chat. If you go to freshcoastguardians.com, um, there are, there are menu choices at the top of the screen, one of which is green strategies. There's a drop down menu that goes to one of the options is rain garden. And there are all kinds of videos. There are all kinds, uh, some of which are hosted by Melinda Myers. We work with her pretty frequently. That helps you um, select the plants. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Megan to talk about rain barrels. Take it away, Megan. Thanks, Chris. Okay, that was so fun. I have seen that presentation twice now and I've learned something each time I've seen you present that. So, so fun. Um, also two things, uh, there are most likely a lot of questions and comments. We'll have 10 minutes at the end of this, um, my presentation to um, answer your questions and to chit chat about resources. Um, if you want some resources that Chris listed, um, you can do like, garden dash on your email. And then after I'm done presenting or during my presentation, if you want some resources, you could go barrel dash and then your email and we can get you some information. Um, so yeah, so here's our rain barrel workshop that we put on. Um, the picture is uh, what we would call the barrel dive. And um, my colleague Ashley Strabel with Douglas County uh, Land and Water Conservation District, she's in one of the barrels. Uh, we have a very hands-on workshop that we do. Um, so yeah, I work for the City of Superior. I'm a water resources specialist, but I specifically work in the Environmental Services Division. We do quite a bit of um, wastewater and stormwater outreach and education. Um, so we'll, I'll give an overview about what we do up here, and then an overview about the rain barrel project, and then um, and we'll just dive into what it takes to assemble um, a barrel and install. So the Environmental Services Division it essentially manages water pollution um, from our community. Uh, so we focus on wastewater and stormwater. And as Chris mentioned, uh, we are also um, work under the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources permit um, to kind of maintain um, both wastewater and stormwater um, management. And in terms of stormwater, since that's a theme of today and this week, um, I'll showcase a couple of things that the uh, City of Superior manages, specifically ESD, the Environmental Services Division. Uh, we have quite a few storm drains and um, stormwater 
best management practices and infrastructure, including uh, two water quality basins, two constructed wetlands, a couple of wet ponds, a uh, couple of dry ponds and dry, uh, rain gardens. Um, and then we also um, have a sewer shed. And I think what's been really fun about this uh, collaboration with Chris is we are two of the cities in Wisconsin that have combined. So we both uh, know how to talk about it and highlight it. Um, it's a great connection to have because um, it is pretty unique. Uh, so here is a map of City of Superior. On the north, uh, the top of the map is a north end. On the bottom of the map is the south end and then west and east. Um, and so what we're showing here is our sewer shed that has the storm branch. So the separate storm sewer in blue. Uh, so that's where the stormwater leaving the city is directed to our streams um, and then eventually Lake Superior. Um, and then our combined branch is the green. So that's where our wastewater and stormwater is combined and treated. Um, just to give you a visual of how much water we are taking on or um, moving to a local water body. So in most areas um, in the city of Superior and Douglas County and throughout the uh, state of Wisconsin, stormwater does not get treated. Um, and stormwater runoff is one of the leading causes of surface water pollution. And when we're talking about surface water pollution, it is uh, there are lakes and rivers. Um, so water that um, we interact with daily. And so when it rains, um, that water is collected in storm drains and ditches, and it drains um, to what we have up here um, in the city of Superior are seven named streams. Um, and so these kind of act as a way to convey the water to our uh, Lake Superior, um, first the St. Louis River estuary and then Lake Superior, um, which is our drinking water source. Uh, and it holds 10% of the world's fresh water. Um, and it's one of the largest Great Lakes and uh, largest freshwater lakes and surface area in the world. So it's a very precious resource and it's at the headwaters of all the other Great Lakes. So we have a big responsibility along with all the other cities surrounding Lake Superior to protect that resource. Um, and then also um, Douglas County, it has a number. I like to highlight Douglas County because this workshop uh, partnership is with uh, Douglas County. Um, there are a number of freshwater lakes and, and rivers in, lakes in uh, Douglas County as well. But as I mentioned, Lake Superior, um, it is our final um, stopping point for a lot of this water for a number of years before it kind of cycles out or the water cycle takes it on its journey to other parts of the world. Um, but in terms of storm water management programs um, in the city of Superior, we are guided by uh, six minimum control measures. And um, I help to manage the public education and outreach and public involvement and participation, which includes uh, lessons and we have an adopt a storm jam program and citizen stream monitoring um, and our rain barrel workshop. These are just to highlight a couple things along with an illicit discharge detection and elimination program, uh, which my coworker Adele manages. And then uh, going on to the next three uh, permit requirements, uh, we have construction site pollutant control and post-construction stormwater management, which my coworker Michael manages. He makes sure that these uh, sites up here that are showing um, Look like this. <laughs> so he is working with contractors and um, folks that are constructing uh, things throughout the city um, to make sure that that soil erosion and sediment stays on site um, or doesn't happen. Um, along with, we have a number of, like any city, um, has some pollution prevention and good housekeeping. Um, we have a bulb shed that collects fluorescent bulbs and um, a street sweeper as well. Um, collect tons and tons of sediment and uh, things collected off the street each year. Um, so next we're gonna um, talk about the project overview of the rain barrel project, why it's important to collect rain, and then the guided instruction. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, I work with Ashley with Douglas County Land and Water Conservation District or Department, and we applied for um, funding from the Environmental Reserve for barrel supplies. And then the City of Superior ESD, we provided the barrels. Um, so the goals of this uh, workshop and project are to discuss rain barrel benefits, uh, simple steps for residents to reduce stormwater runoff, and then a guided instruction on how to build the rain barrel. Um, and I think also something to add here, 
Um, it really does depend on the person. Um, there are so many different ways to build a rain barrel. Um, it all depends on funding, um, resources, and uh, I guess uh, preference as well. So it's been really great to talk with Chris because he's been doing this for a number of years and has a lot of great resources being in Milwaukee. So I've learned a ton from him just by simply talking about this. So, um, so if you have any questions, again, keep um, throwing them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, so why collect rain? Well, we have some really, a couple of really good reasons. One thing I like to highlight is um, it'll help you save some money. So rather than turning on your, um, your hose or your faucet to water your plants outside. You can use rainwater that you've collected for free. Um, it also helps to prevent localized flooding. You're collecting that rain that would normally just fall at your foundation um, of your house or um, at your garage or near your uh, walkway. And you're helping to collect that rain and direct it somewhere else or keep it within the barrel. Um, you're also reducing stormwater pollution. So the more water you can collect, the less chance of it running off your yard and the road and bringing um, some pollution to our waterways. Uh, so collecting rainwater de decreases the amount of runoff coming from your property and entering our waterways. Oh, and this is Sue. Uh, she is pictured here. Uh, she joined us this past um, summer for the rain barrel workshop. And then we jump into the guided instruction. Here's a really great picture of participants a couple of years ago assembling their barrels. You'll see a couple barrel dives happening and their supplies. Um, it's really a, quite a fun workshop. Um, so one of the things I like to, a uh, couple of things I like to talk about before we jump into the instruction is site selection and preparation. So we really wanna have a, um, prepared site for your barrel because once it gets full of water, you don't want it to tip over. It's kind of cumbersome and it's heavy. So we don't want anyone to get hurt or don't want it to crush some of your plants, whatever it is. So you could reuse cinder blocks or bricks um, that can serve as excellent bases because um, dirt can shift and compact. Um, so if you have, or a sidewalk or whatever it is that um, is already flat space, you can get creative with what you want to use. Um, next step is to find a downspout. So we want to find a place for, um, for water that is already directed, or maybe you just need to add a downspout to your rain collection system, your gutter system, and make sure that we have um, an overflow um, that we'll be installing in the barrels that I'll be guiding you through uh, that installation process. But some people may use um, a diverter kit. Um, actually, Chris has mentioned um, and has used these for some of his barrel kits. And what it is, is it's just an attachment straight to the downspout. So you don't have to cut the downspout in half or off. Um, and Chris, if you'd like to add anything, I do have more information on this next slide too. Um, sure, I guess I can chime in just for a second or two here. Uh, we, with our rain barrel program, we had originally started um, we're on about our fifth generation of rain barrels as we've learned from past designs. So one of the keys to using that diverter piece, which I believe costs about somewhere between 15 and $20 if you buy that online somewhere, um, is that you'd simply have to drill a hole in your downspout like, like the um, slide shows that's on the screen and it eliminates the need for having that overflow. So it might give you more flexibility where you could use your, your rain barrel. Um, Cause if you don't have to worry about an overflow once the barrel is full and directing that across your sidewalk or something, um, you might be able to put a rain barrel in a place where you otherwise wouldn't. So that is how we always install our rain barrels now. And it's kind of revolutionized the rain barrel program. Um, but you can still install them the other way, uh, cutting off the downspout, directing it in into the rain barrel. But once your barrel is full, you're going to need to direct that water out of your barrel and, and someplace else. The other advantage um, to using that diverter is I, I don't have to cut, cut off my downspout at all. So it I don't have to disconnect it from the storm sewer system that it's hard piped into. 
So it gave me a lot of flexibility to install my own rain barrels. Thanks, Chris. And so here's a couple of the steps to take. Um, I was just curious what it would take to actually install a diverter. And it seems pretty awesome um, to not have to move anything once your barrel's full that overflow just would then continue into from your barrel and back into downspout. So you wouldn't have to move anything. Um, so some other tips and tricks for maintaining your barrel throughout the seasons. Um, so we have uh, April through September. The biggest thing is management of mosquito and algae growth in the barrels. Um, we suggest using, um, uh, you can either drain your barrel fully if you'd like to um, wash your barrel out every month, you can do that. Otherwise, you could add a quarter cup of oil, um, just regular vegetable oil or cooking oil to essentially kind of um, suffocate the algae or the um, algae and uh, mosquito larvae so they cannot grow any further. Um, you can also add, let's see here in my notes, I have it around somewhere. You can also add the one to two tablespoons of dish soap. So you have a couple options that are a little bit more environmentally friendly and they don't harm, those kind of things don't harm the, um, the uh, plants if you're gonna be watering your plants with that water. Um, also in October, we're asking that you fully drain your rain barrel and wash it before you put it into storage. After you fully drain it from October to March, you turn your barrel upside down um, because, and if you especially are storing it outside, if you still have it um, right side up and the water um, collects in the bottom and then it freezes and it then cracks the barrel. Um, so then you don't have a rain barrel anymore, which is such a bummer. So a simple trick is to just flip it upside down if you don't have room in your house um, or in your garage, flip it upside down, put it under your eaves. Otherwise in your house or in your garage, if your garage is um, still not insulated or um, heated, I would still flip it upside down and store your hoses and mesh screens with your barrel somewhere. Um, and uh, those kind of tips should help maintain your barrel over the seasons. Uh, this is our list of supplies and tools needed. Uh, as I mentioned, so the City of Superior Environmental Services Division uh, provides the barrels um, for the project. And within those barrels, uh, we had uh, polymer. Polymer is a non-hazardous, non-toxic material that is used in the solid waste treatment process. And so what we would do is take these barrels and we would um, cut the tops off. Um, so we would start by removing the top of the barrel. Um, so if you're reusing some sort of barrel from um, food production or whatever it is, you might have to do this as well. And then we spent a lot of time cleaning these barrels. Um, and it took a lot of hot water and a lot of soap to get that polymer out. Um, and then we, before the workshop, what we did is we drilled the holes for the spigot and the overflow. Um, the spigot is a one inch spade and the overflow hole is a, um, let's see here, one and three quarter inch hole saw. And then um, when we were done drilling those holes and cutting them out the top, we would then use a metal file to get those burrs, those plastic burrs off. Um, the overflow is about two inches from the top and, or two inches, four inches from the top and the um, spigot is about four inches from the bottom. Um, and you can kind of determine which spot you'd like that, but the overflow we put about 90 degrees up from the spigot. And then we're installing the spigot. Here's our supplies. We have the uh, brass spigot with the um, plastic washer and brass nut, and then our Teflon tape. And what you want to do is first wrap the Teflon tape uh, clockwise about four times on the threaded piece of your spigot, and then you turn it into the barrel. Um, so it's facing the right way up. Uh, the next step is, um, I guess we, we also didn't have this step in the pictures, but we add a sealant to the spigot before we um, screw it into the barrel so that it helps to seal the barrel. Um, and we also add that sealant on the back of the washer before we put it um, on the inside of the barrel. This is where the barrel dive happens. You're diving into the barrel, most likely on the ground. And then the next step is to grab that um, uh, that nut and you tighten it 
you will need a partner in crime for this because someone needs to hold the washer or the um, spigot on the outside and then you'll dive into the barrel and tighten that nut. Just don't tighten it too much. We've actually had really strong people like totally tighten it too much and then pull the spigot through the barrel. <laughs> and you don't want that. Um, the, the sealant will help to seal the barrel. So even if it's not on absolutely completely tight, that sealant will help um, seal the barrel. Um, and then, Next step is the overflow adapter. So if you are um, using a diverter, this is not necessarily something you would need to do, but for us, um, this is what we supply for people. And uh, so we do the Teflon tape, same as the um, spigot, and then we do the sealant on where that Teflon tape was applied. And then we put that piece into the overflow pre-cut hole. And on the other side, we add an adapter um, so it's a nice clean um, entrance or exit for the water and um, add some sealant to that PVC pipe uh, fitting as well. And then we take a um, flat nose uh, screwdriver or a flat nose uh, flathead driver. What am I trying to say? Um, where are my notes? Uh, flathead screwdriver. Yes, I was right the first time. Um, and we're tightening on the sump pump hose uh, so you can direct the water away from your um, house, your foundation. And um, again, that's exactly what I have here. We're directing the water during rain events so that once your barrel is full, the water has a place to go, maybe to a garden or a tree that needs extra water. Um, and we wanna be checking the hose periodically to be sure it is positioned correctly. Um, and then we're attaching, we provide a screen and so you can fit that to your barrel as best as you can. You can make, you can cut it if you'd like, but then we have a bungee cord rope that we provide as well. You tie that off nice and tight and it's ready to install. Uh, one tip, do not drink your rainwater. Um, it is not suitable for human or um, animal consumption. It's best for watering plants or washing your hands. And here are some resources. Um, and thank you so much. We'll turn it over. Um, to some questions now. I've been trying to answer a lot of the questions in as close to real time. Oh, great! As I as I could. And uh, you you just mentioned that it don't drink the water in a rain barrel. And there was a question in the chat about can you water vegetables with it or not. And so I answered that. Um, I don't have the citation because the, the questioner asked for the citation, but I am aware that there's an academic study that I believe was done on the East Coast somewhere that looks into that issue of whether or not um, I should use my rain wa barrel water on a vegetable garden. Personally, I do. I don't worry a whole lot about that. Um, and I'm probably not going to measure any pollutants generated from that. Um, to the level that that academic study did. So I guess my recommendation would be, um, if that is of concern to you, because I do have typical asphalt sh shingles, and what happens is um, a lot of the debris and such tends to, to migrate to the bottom of my barrel and is kind of decanted down there. Um, so I typically use the vast majority of my rain barrel water to water my pollinator gardens. As, as as well. So if it's of concern to you, then I guess just don't. Um, but I have seen a study that that dove deeper into that issue than I probably ever ever anticipate doing. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it looks like there is a question that says, "Who maintains the rain gardens? Do the landowners get any training or support for weeding and long term maintenance?" uh yeah i i threw an answer in the chat to that but because okay. i forgot to mention that in my um during my presentation typical typical rain garden maintenance isn't really much more difficult than um than you would be for a vegetable garden you're going to need to watch for weeds and and pull invasives out it's always a good idea right after you plant your rain garden to take pictures of your newly planted plants. So you will recognize them when they come up in the following year because they're going to look different when they're first poking through the ground. And some of them do look a little weed-like. 
Mm -hmm. um, as time goes by, uh, some natives will run wild on you. So you might want to thin them a little bit. Um, but typically it, that, that's about how difficult it is. So it's generally done you know, by the homeowner, by the person that owns a rain garden. And then uh, Beth Peterson asked, uh, can the presentations be shared? Um, yes, um, Chris with Wisconsin Land and Water will have things posted to their website. And then Wisconsin Stormwater um, Group, the Stormwater Week Group will have on our website as well. Uh, let's see here. What is the difference between pollinator garden and ring garden? Have you answered that question, Chris? I did. Um, okay, great. But basically, a pollinator garden is just an area that's planted specifically with native plants that attract typical of Wisconsin pollinators, hummingbirds, butterflies, uh, bees, and that type of stuff. But it's not dug out like a rain garden is, and it doesn't necessarily need a water source like a downspout going to it. Um, so most of my natives in my yard are not rain gardens. They are just areas that I dug out and instead of planting um, cultivars or anything like that, I, I specifically picked out natives to in particular attract hummingbirds because they're just kind of neat. Uh, I had a question, uh, Jane Weir. Um, Jane, do you mind jumping on and asking your question? Looks like you're muted. There I go. Um, yeah, I, I have two questions. One of them was, um, my, I've got a rain barrel that has a hose that goes down the hill and into my garden area. And I was told that in the winter, all I had to do was just um, uh, open up that shutoff valve at the end of the hose to let all the drain all the water out. Should I not be doing that? Should I be actually um, taking it apart and putting it upside down? Uh, that would be my recommend recommendation. Uh, you don't necessarily, I think it Unfortunately, each barrel is different. So the type of plastic or wood or whatever it is that's made, it, it is made out of um, may not crack, but to prevent things from cracking or breaking down, um, I, I would suggest, yeah, um, kind of putting in a safe place and turning. So you're, are you saying you leave your barrel out and that hose? Yes, and okay. just open up the hose yeah. so it drains that's, completely. Yeah, and that's great too. Um, that could be your first step. Are you, are you, um, does your barrel have any cracks yet? Nothing, no. <laughs> okay, I'm actually kind of surprised. That, I mean, that's cool, I'm glad for you. And, and check right, it. <laughs> so, so that's what's interesting about these practices is it really does depend on the type of material, material we use. Generally, you do wanna turn your barrel upside down. Okay. So if it's working for you, keep doing that, but I would definitely <laughs> recommend, yeah, maybe removing that. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks Thank for your you. question. Thanks. Yeah. There's a really interesting question uh, from Michelle Myers. Does anyone put charcoal or biochar in their barrels to filter? Not to my knowledge. That would be a new one for me as well. Yeah. I know that there are some, some parts of kits where you can get a small screen or a small filter that will keep some of the particulates from going in there. Um, that's not something I use but I do pull my diverter piece out probably every other week because I live next to a person with a willow tree and I don't, I do not have leaf guards on my gutters. So if I don't pull that out, my overflow becomes my gutter. So that's a good practice as well. Make sure. We get all these questions. Um, do mosquitoes breed in barrels? Uh, yeah, they any type of open water. Um, yeah, definitely, they love it. I like I recommended some little bit of soap or oil or those uh, mosquito dunks if you can find some of those. Those are biological kind of activity in the water. I, I see a question about a maximum distance recommended from a downspout of the house to a rain garden. And does it matter about seasons? Um, once you disconnect your downspout or like I am, it's going to function like it will all winter long. Sometimes it'll be partially frozen, sometimes it won't. So that shouldn't really affect where your rain garden is. 
but you just need to pay attention to slope at all times. You can have your rain garden as far away as you want, but then you're going to have potentially a black pipe or something running to it across your lawn. So distance isn't a factor within reason, as long as you have a means of getting the water there. And um, no, I don't believe it does matter about the seasons. Okay, we are at one o'clock. Do you want to quickly answer Chuck's question, last question there? about if you get a bigger, would you get a bigger rain barrel so it doesn't fill so quickly? And is there a way to determine which are shallow rooted weeds compared to the natives when you're weeding? And then we'll uh, we'll end the webinar since it's one o'clock. Yeah, I guess there are a couple different things you could do with collecting rain. Um, I know, uh, Chris, you've shown me your, your, like, I think it's like two or three barrel system. Yeah. You can always cascade one barrel into another. In my, in my, in my situation, I only have one spot on my house. That's a good location to put rain barrels. So I put two of them. I put one next to the other. And so when one, one fills, it just water seeks its own level. It spills into the adjacent barrel. So that's one way you could do it. Sometimes people get a hold of used totes and things and and can get about a 200 gallon container and can hook that up with the diverter um there was the question about the shallow roots versus the, the deep roots and weeding um my best word of advice there is take those pictures after you plant because i'm quite sure i've probably accidentally pulled out a native or two and you'll get better at it over time. But I took pictures and I labeled all of my pictures and I printed them out on a sheet. So I know when I'm looking around, there are also apps on your, on your phone. Uh, picture this is one where you can take a picture and it's pretty good at recognizing even young plants and telling you what it is and then giving you some information on that. So that's the best advice I can get or I can give. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Megan and Chris. And as you saw, I'll be sending out an evaluation link soon. And this will include a link to the recording once it's up on our website. So thanks, everyone. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.